You can remain in your Bibles, and I'm going to read in English for you uh, the passage as well. Again, it's 1 John chapter 1, and it's beginning at verse uh, 5, and we'll have that on the screen uh, in a moment. And that would be awesome. Hey, there we are. Thank you. This is the message we have heard from and declared to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. This is God's word for us today. Let me ask you this question. What, what, what brings you joy? Think about that for a minute. What brings you joy? Joy is that excitement that is within us, that when something happens or we see something, or we hear something, um, it just lightens us up, doesn't it? It doesn't have to be circumstantial. It could just be a thought. It could be a word. But joy, it it burns within us. We have to do something with us when we're joyful. I think joy keeps us from being bored. I think joy lends richness and color to every experience we go through. That's joy. So what brings you joy? You know, as, as I'm asking that, I think sometimes it's easier to answer, what doesn't bring me joy? I think actually often that comes a lot quicker. But that's not our question this morning, is what brings you joy? I have uh, a couple of neighbors on either side. One of my neighbors, they have two little boys. And I think they're about two and four, or maybe they're three and five now. And uh, one's name is Henry, uh, the five-year-old, and the, the youngest guy, his name is Theo. It's like my son. And um, he, he's a redhead, like my boy. So there's a bit of an affinity that I have towards them, and they've been there for a couple of years now. And what we do is we've gotten to know each other. Um, in the summer, they like to pick raspberries off my raspberry bush, and so we share raspberries. Um, as, uh, as we head out to our cars to go to different places and they go in with mom and dad, they, they make sure they stop, the car stops, and they wave to me as I'm getting into my car, and I wave to them. As we're in our yards, we kind of talk back and forth to each other. We enjoy life together. It's a lot of fun. I love those two little boys. This past Christmas, we had very little snow. I don't know how many of you skied. Any of you ski? If you ski or snowboard, it was probably a depressing Christmas this past year, right? It, it, it was, because we had such little snow. So I thought for Christmas Day, I know how my neighbors, the little boys, they love to play in snow. Who doesn't love to play in snow? So I think I might have a picture here. I drove up to, to uh, Hemlock, and I filled up my truck with snow. I came down, and on Christmas Day morning, before anybody got up, I shoveled that snow uh, in their front yard, which is adjacent to ours, knowing that they would play, hoping that they would play. And you see pictures here of them coming out, and they played in the snow. They threw snowballs to each other. They, um, they, they built the snowman. I gave them a little kit, and they built the snowman, and, and had a lot of fun. In fact, I had a lot of joy just watching them play in it. The one picture has the snowman covered with an umbrella. It poured at Christmas, if you remember. (laughs) We wanted to keep it as long as possible. So um, January went by, February came, and my neighbors, uh, their father, he wanted to introduce his kids to what he enjoyed as as a child. And when he was a kid, what his parents did is they went camping and skiing. So they went winter camping. I don't know how many of you are into winter camping, but they bought a trailer so they could go winter camping. They drove it up to Manning, middle of February, and uh, went skiing. They were gone for about a week. I ended up leaving about the same time. I came home at the end of their trip and at the end of my trip on a Sunday night, and this is what I found. (laughs) My neighbors 
brought snow back from Manning in their vehicle to do this for me. You know what brings me great joy? <laughs> I thought I was serving others. Great joy is when we serve each other. <laughs> That's joy. Are you experiencing joy? What brings you joy? You know, Pastor Kyle last week began preaching in the book of 1 John chapter 1, and he did verse 1 to verse 4. And at the end of verse 4, it says this line. I don't have it on the screen for, oh, maybe I do. There it is. We write this to make our joy complete. We write this to make our joy complete. And, and this letter was written by uh, John about 60 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It was written in response to the challenges the early churches were going through. And one of those challenges is that they began to lose the sense of joy that Jesus Christ gives. Hard to believe, but it's true. But maybe it isn't hard to believe. Do we lose the sense of joy that Christ gives? I think sometimes we do. As things burden us, as things weigh on us. So John writes this letter, and he writes this to the churches then and to us. And he says, we write this letter, in other words, the life of Jesus, the message of Jesus, to make our joy complete. So he wants to remind them of Jesus Christ's joy, the joy of the gospel. So what is this joy? That's our question. It's two things. It comes in two things. One is this, joy comes from truth. Joy comes from truth. Joy also comes from fellowship. Okay? Joy comes from truth and joy comes from fellowship. And that's really what we're going to chat for the next little bit about. And the first thing is this, the truth. What is the truth here? You can read in verse 5, it says this. It starts off with this. This is the message we have heard from him, that's Jesus Christ, and declare to you. And he says this. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. So here's our truth to wrestle this morning. God is light. Whenever you're reading scripture and it says God is something, pay attention to whatever that something is. Because it means it's his character. It's, it's who he is. It's, it's how he is. It's what he gives. It's what we need. And it's the truth. So God is light. So what does that mean? What does light do? What does light accomplish? What does God accomplish? Sim simply put, if you want to understand the character of God, then observe what light is, what light does. I think one of the things that light does is it reveals. Light reveals. Light reveals us here. I can see you, you can see me. <laughs> if there was darkness, I could hear you. You could probably hear me, but we couldn't see each other. Light reveals. What else does light do? Hmm. Darkness conceals, it says here in verse 5, but light reveals. I think light also reveals perspective. So I can see you, you can see me, but not only that, I can see what you wear. I can see what you look like. <laughs> I can see how tall or how short, how young or how old. It gives us a perspective. We need perspective. Light gives us that. We need to see the big picture. We need to see the truth of things. And what God says is he is light. So he will give us truth. He sees the entire perspective. He sees how it all is. And he wants to tell us this. I don't know about you, but I need answers. I need answers all the time. I think humankind is forever seeking to solve puzzles of life on every level. I need answers to the economic life. I need answers to the political life. Oh my goodness, we all need answers with that. I need answers with the social life. I need answers to scientific life. I need answers with the psychological life. Whatever it may be, we are confronted with mysteries and puzzles at every turn, aren't we? We need answers. And God says, I am light. I see it all. I have the perspective. I can give it to you. He gives answers. God removes the darkness to give us answers. That's what truth does. I need answers to my marriage. 
I need answers to my past. I need answers to pain. I need answers to evil. I need to figure out what is death all about. I need answers to joy. I need answers to my purpose. I need answers to the future beyond this life. I need answers. What answers are you asking for? Are you asking? Where are you going for answers? We all need answers. It says here, Jesus Christ gives answers. Jesus Christ gives answers. Answers. In fact, a couple of times in verse 6 and later, I think in verse 8 or 9, it says, he'll give the truth. He says it twice. Light reveals. Light gives perspective. And there's a third thing I think here. I know we can run with this pretty far, but light, I think, energizes us. How many of us love the sun? Wasn't today a great day to drive out to church? <laughs> Is it more exciting to drive in the sun or in the rain? The sun or in the snow? The sun, right? Why? Because it gives us life. It motivates us. It gets us out to want to do something. Probably more often than not. We love sunrises and sunsets, I think. It was great to see one last night. I think we love them because of the colors they produce. But I wonder if we love the sunrise because it says, hey, good morning, hello, especially when nobody else says that to you. <laughs> you know, that, the sunrise isn't miserable. <laughs> They're there to see you. It's there to see you. And I think maybe the sunset's the same. Maybe the sunset says, hey, it's a great day. Time to have a rest. I can't wait to see you tomorrow. You ever think of it that way? And what comes up tomorrow? The sunrise and the sunset each and every day. We love it. It's motivation. It energizes us. And that's what God says he does. God is light. God intensifies. He fulfills. He glorifies our essential humanity. He does not destroy it. He takes it and he leads it on through the darkness into an ever-growing experience of life and vitality and productivity. That's our God. A few years ago, I had the privilege, I had a guy that came to the church I was in uh, named Greg, and Greg and I, Greg was a hunter. I'm not a hunter, um, but I do like what hunters uh, do, and I do like eating what hunters do. And um, so he wanted to go, he came to me, he said, Todd, let's, let's go for a trip. And I said, okay, uh, where are we going? He said, we're going to go mountain goat hunting. I'm like, yeah, that's what I, exactly. I'm like, huh, hmm, huh, hmm, never been, not really a hiker. Um, anyways, we went to a place uh, near Terrace, B.C., on a mountain there that he had, uh, uh, was able to go there to, uh, to, to get a goat. And it was about 6,500 feet up. So we climb this mountain. We get to probably uh, just a valley area. And above the valley is probably about another 400 feet. So we get there. It's clear. It's sunny. But if you've ever been hiking or been on at places that are high, the wind is often swirling and blowing, and it often brings clouds in, and they move and, and all of that. So there was a number of clouds around, um, and it was kind of moving around, but it was still beautiful and sunny. So my friend says, we looked around. We didn't see any goats in the area where we were, which we came for. So he said, Todd, what we have to do, because it was summer, the goats go up to the top. So he says, okay, we got to go up. 450 feet more. Now this last 450 feet was all shale. And a lot of it was broken up, but it was shale. So we slowly climb up. We get from about 10 feet from the top. And my friend says, wait here. I'm going to go up and on and over, just in case, you know, I don't know if the goat's on the other side. You wait here uh, for about 10 minutes and then you come up. So as I was waiting there, I'm counting in my head. I'm, I'm kind of getting excited. I don't know what to, to, to think or not. And um, and I don't hear anything. He's gone. Like, he's gone. And all of a sudden, as he's gone, a big dark cloud moves in. Okay? I can't see a thing other than maybe about five feet in front of my face. Finish my 10 minutes. I'm like, okay, this cloud's eventually going to move. I'm going to climb up to the top. So I start climbing up, and I'm on the top. And on the top, I could see enough that it was still a dark cloud, but the path up top was about five feet wide. But you could see hoof prints all along. Like, God made mountain goats amazing. I can't believe they can run across this thing. So as I'm up there, I'm kind of looking around for mountain goats. I'm, I'm looking for my friend. 
It's still dark. I'm like, okay, I think I'm just going to stand here for a little bit. So sometimes when you don't know what to do, it's good to stay. <laughs> so the dark cloud moves. And as the dark cloud moves, I, and I'm standing there, all of a sudden, I saw where I came from and the valley. I look over to the other side, and I'm four feet from sheer rock that goes down about 450, 500 feet, which I did not see. I see my friend. He's 30 feet over in front of me. I did not see him. I did not hear him. I had no idea where he was. That's what darkness does, doesn't it? It hides things. It doesn't open things up. But when the cloud moves, when things uh, finally move, we can actually see. And we got down from that hill. We actually managed to find a goat the next day. When we got down, I found out later that actually my friend, one of his uncles, passed away on that very hill. They never found him. God said to you, you need me. Why? Because I'm light. I will answer the questions you're looking for. I will open up and let you know what you need. I am light. I am, there's no darkness in me at all. I want to open things up for you. Do you want that? That's what he's saying here. God is light. In him, there is no darkness at all. We need the light to shine upon the mysteries of darkness in our world and in our own lives. And this is what God does. And this is what he's going to do now in verse 6 to 10 for us. He's going to walk us through and give us examples of what Christ wants to open our eyes up to. Joy comes from the truth that God is light. Talk to him. Ask him. Thank him. Second thing joy comes is fellowship. Joy comes from fellowship. Kyle introduced fellowship to us last week. Fellowship, Kyle said, means partnership, friendship, to have things in common. It's more than a relationship. It's a back and forth. It's a needing of each other. It's a beautiful bond. Fellowship. Verse 6 to 10 here says, John wants to remind us that joy comes in our fellowship with God and with each other. And he does this by telling us a few things. He tells us the challenges of fellowship with God and the hope we have. And that's what we're going to finish our time with by looking at this morning. The challenges and our hope. There are three challenges to the fellowship that we have with God and the fellowship that we have with others. There's more than that, but we've got three today to look at. The first one is this, saying versus doing. Verse 6 says this, If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. What's God saying here? What God is saying here is we cannot have fellowship with God and at the same time live in darkness or walk in darkness. What God is saying is we cannot have a relationship with God and at the same time live, practice sin. That's what darkness is meant to here. We can't. It doesn't work that way. We cannot expect to hang out with God and have, a deep and have him reveal deep truths about us while we live our lives in ways that we want to please ourselves. It doesn't work that way, is what God is saying here. If we claim to love Jesus on a Sunday, I must live a life of loving Jesus from Monday to Saturday, <laughs> is what he's saying here. It would be like saying, I love you, but I never show it. Or saying, I'll be there on time, but always showing up late or never showing up at all. I don't know if you ever have that issue. I have that issue. <laughs> or saying, I have done something, but I actually never did it. He says, we, we lie. We lie. What we say is always proven by how we behave. That's what God is saying. What we say is always proven by how we behave. When these don't match up, we actually lose trust. We lose relationship. We lose fellowship. And we know that, don't we? But get this, when they match up, we build trust and we build fellowship. When I do what I say, it builds. And the same goes with us with God. 
If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. And God says here, if this is our relationship with God, stop it. That's what he says. In fact, we could probably take it even further. If this is our relationship with others, stop it. <laughs> oh. hmm. I don't know about you, but okay, I need hope. <laughs> How do we do that? Especially if it's a habit. What does verse 7 say here? But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sins. Through Jesus Christ, we have been given a choice. We can walk in the light. We can walk in the light. It doesn't say be perfect. It says walk. Like just begin step after step in the light. Walk with God. That's the relationship that he's asking from us. And we can do it. Why? Because God is light and he brings us along. Love this. Walk in the light as, he in the, as he's in the light means to walk as Jesus did. But it also means that we have the power to walk as Jesus did. You recall when Jesus was baptized here on this earth, what came down? Do you remember at all that? A dove. And then God spoke from heaven and said, This is my son whom I'm well pleased, whom I love. And the Holy Spirit came upon him. We have that Holy Spirit. In here... If you've accepted Jesus as your Savior and Lord and made that choice, we have the Holy Spirit who will lead us in light and in love and gives us the power to walk through the sin that we're faced with and challenged on a day-to-day -day basis. We've been giving him. It says here, and as we walk in the light, we actually have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, purifies us from all sins. In other words, we will have joy that comes from a great relationship if we walk in the light. You ever walk in, in the light and discover a truth of God and all of a sudden you're just like, oh, where was this? Oh, I can't wait to have that. We will have the joy knowing that our sins are forgiven and forgotten by God as we walk in the light. That's our hope. That's God's promise. He does that. He does that. Challenge number two. Self-deception and limited perspective, I think. Self-deception and limited perspective. Notice what it says in verse 8. It says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. You know, sin is that fallen twisted thing in our minds and in our experience that makes us want to play God on every occasion. That's what sin is. Sin actually is wanting to be like God, Genesis 3. They wanted to make choices for themselves, Adam and Eve. They wanted to understand good from evil. That's what they wanted to know. And I think that's what we do too. We crave it actually. We know how this is. We want the world to revolve around us, don't we? Don't we always want to be the center of things? Maybe not publicly, but, but we want to operate as if we're the one that everything operates around. We always want to be the center of things. We're self-centered, and this is sin. It goes by other names. It goes by pride, selfishness, or independence. And that is the root the twist in human nature that makes us commit sin. Sin says truth is how I choose to define it. Because I'm God. That's what sin says. Sin allows us to believe that we are God. <laughs> and actually we can do some things. We can make some choices. Verse 8 here it says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. And truth is not in us. Sin does exist. I, I don't think... <laughs> look around. <laughs> look around. 
If we want perspective, all we have to do is remember the words of a pastor and theologian, D.L. Moody, when someone came up to him and told him that he had reached the place where he no longer sinned, Mr. Moody, in his way, said this, well, I'd like to ask your wife about that. <laughs> That's a good quote to take home. So where's our hope? Where's our hope? How do we get through this one? Verse 9 says this. This is a good verse to remember if you've never memorized anything, or maybe you have. Verse 9 says this. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. That's not a great verse. Great truth. God's light. Don't we need that? Is that what you need today? It's interesting. He says here, if we confess our sins... <laughs> In other words, if you admit to it, admit to it, you haven't got it all together. <laughs> admit to it, you made a mistake. Admit to it, you hurt somebody. Admit it to God. That's what he's asking here. God, I'm sorry, please forgive me. I am not God. Here I am again. You're God. I don't know about you, but sometimes when, I, when I, I think about the mistakes that I've made and how I've hurt people, <laughs> I think God does not want to hear from me. That sounds, that's wrong. It's wrong. Because God is light. But my head tells me that. And so I don't want to come to the light. I want to, to hide it. I want to, 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 to wrestle in my shame. I want to, I don't know what I want. But what I am trying to do or what I am doing is not helping me at all. And God says, come to me. Come to me and admit it. Because if you come to me and confess your sins, he's what? He's faithful. He will always, he will always, he will always, he will always be there. He will always, he will always, he will always listen to you. He will always, he will always, he will always want to wrap his arms around you and be just and he will forgive you and purify you. And when you let that soak in, freedom. Not to sin, to walk in the light. To walk in the light. And the more we do that, the more we walk in the light and the more we understand that. And the more that sin goes this way and we go this way. And that's what he says here. He says, admit it. I think he also says, look in the mirror and be honest with ourselves. How many of us are really honest with ourselves? Hmm. Honesty is a hard thing sometimes. But God knows. God is light knows. You know, maybe we just need to ask the question, how is that working for you? <laughs> how is that working for me? I need God. What sin and my inability to overcome uh, it does is it draws me to God, or it should draw me to God. And the closer I get to, the, to God, I discover the beauty of humility. And humility is one of the best things about fellowship, isn't it? Wouldn't this be a great way to develop relationships? If we um, are honest, if we admit to our challenges and our faults, if we forgive... It is. It's beautiful. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. We then get joy. Others then get joy. Last challenge here, it says in verse 10, if we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. Are you, are you noticing the progression here? We're not going to spend much time on this one, but notice the progression. It goes from being a, 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 a liar, just you know, doing a little bit of sin, trying to dabble in it, trying to do gray. There's no gray with God. It's black or white. But we start with a little bit of sin, and then it goes down to the next one that says, if we claim we have no sin. So, so it just gets a little heavier, a little darker. And then it gets to this one, and it says, we claim that we have not sinned. <laughs> we have never sinned. That's what happens when we walk in darkness, is we start believing lies. We start writing our own narrative. 
and it pulling us farther and farther away from God. And that's what's happening, John says, if you don't walk in the light. You're actually calling God, creator God, life-giving God, God who knows us, God who is light, God who is love. You're calling God a liar. That's what he says here. So what's our hope? Chapter 2, 1 to 2, and we're not going to spend much time because I think this is going to be next time for you, but I have it on the screen here, I think. Um, it says this. Here's the hope. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin, but if anybody does sin, we have a advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. In other words, when we're judged, Jesus is there with us. He's leading us. What's kind of interesting is he's the advocate, but he's also the judge. I haven't figured that one out fully yet. But if that's true and I'm loved by him, then that's got to be a good thing. But then it says also in verse 2, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but for the sins of the whole world. In other words, he's taking care of what needs to be taken care of. Save that for next week. Let me finish with this. Um, back in November... I got a phone call, and uh, it was uh, from a friend's wife, and she phoned me in tears, and I said, hey, what's, what's wrong? And, she's, and I hadn't talked to her for uh, probably three, four, five years, and um, she said, uh, I just want to let you know that your friend died. I'm like, what? What? Yeah. My friend I'd known since probably 2003 or two, good friend of mine. We spent a lot of time together. We had to work, we worked through a lot of issues together uh, with our families, with our own challenges. And uh, I met him in Smithers and he stayed living in Smithers when I moved down here. And, and I was sitting there in shock and I was remembering our good times together. And uh, as I was remembering our good times together, I'm like, what in the world happened? I needed answers. <laughs> I needed to be in the light. And um, so his wife started explaining some of the things that went on. And she said, you know, Todd, um, I came home one day and I found a note that was on my desk. And on that note, uh, or, or my husband never came home for the afternoon, which is odd. He never came home for the evening, which is odd. I didn't know where he went, what he did. I had no idea. But I managed to find a note, and on that note, it said, don't worry about it. You and our family will be taken care of. Hmm. Uh, unfortunately, my friend took his life. And unfortunately, well, fortunately, they found him. Unfortunately, his wife and two other close friends found him. My friend and I, we have, he's probably the, the closest friend I've had that did not profess faith in Jesus. We spent many years together, many conversations together. He was a proud atheist. And we would talk about things. He was incredibly loving that way. We could talk about anything, and we did. We talked about God. We talked about atheism. We, we talked about... I, I remember he, he gave me a book of his to read um, so we could get to know each other more. So I said, what better book to give you? I'll give you the Bible. So he read the Bible, and we talked about these things. We spent a lot of time together. We fished together. We rode bikes together. He hated exercise. <laughs> I hated watching zombies, but he introduced me to zombie movies. It's amazing what you do together in relationships for people you care about. So when I heard this news, I didn't know what to do other than, hey, God, what's going on? Um, in February, I had the privilege, my wife and I, to go to a memorial for him. They actually asked if I would lead the memorial. I've met his family like once, 20 years ago. Nobody in the family that I know has any relationship with God. But our God of light, our God who brings in truth, 
our God who opens up doors, our God who sees the big picture, our God who wants to speak and bring his life into life gave me an opportunity on the floor to many people who had never heard or never wanted anything to do with Jesus. Our God gave an opportunity into a family that I didn't have before, who need to see me be Jesus to them. This is our God of life. This is what God does. Our families need him, our friends need him, our enemies need him, our coworkers need him, our spouses need him. They need the God of life because the God of life gives answers. I think that's the hardest thing for me. I can't sit with my friend and give answers anymore. That hurts. Now, where he is is between him and God. But until that day, our people need God of light. But even more than that, our people need truth that comes through us to others, fellowship through us to others. That's how it works. That's what John says. And it's possible because God is the God of light, not the God of darkness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for being God. Thank you for, for being the God of light. Thank you for being the God of truth. Thank you for, for bringing truth to us. Thank you for being, bringing us into fellowship. It's you that has done all this work to bring us to you. It's not me. It's not us. And we get to rejoice in that. And that does bring us joy. Lord, I pray that you would burden our hearts for those around us. Burden our hearts for those who need to hear your joy. Those who need to experience your peace. Those who need future with you and present with you. Lord, burden our hearts for each other and our church family who need it every day. And I ask these things knowing full well that you are answering this. And we get to experience this as we walk in the light, as you are in the light. Heavenly Father, thank you for being beautiful to us and to our world. In Jesus' name I pray. In the name that gives life where there was no life. His name we pray. Amen.